I woke up on Wednesday morning to see the string of tweets that was setting the internet ablaze with outrage. The president announcing a reversal of the year-old policy allowing transgender Americans to serve in the military, writing the United States government will not accept or allow transgender individuals to serve in any capacity in the U.S. military, citing tremendous medical costs and disruption to the military's capacity for decisive and overwhelming victory. At the time, I grabbed my e-popcorn, predicting this would be the internet rage of the year. And I gotta say, so far, it's not disappointing. But that's not to say that this policy change or the way it was handled are free from criticism. I think there are plenty of criticisms reasonable people can raise. Maybe a blanket ban is too broad. Maybe the concerns expressed here could be minimized while still keeping a selection of occupations available to transgender Americans. What's going to happen to transgender military members currently out and currently serving? We don't have a clear answer yet. And that ambiguity seems pretty unfair to those individuals. And at bare minimum, Perhaps it would have been beneficial to let the defense secretary, himself a career military man, announce this change with full details and with a full plan for implementation, rather than just a trio of tweets that leaves an abundance of uncertainty. There are plenty of these reasonable points of criticism to which your average person can be sympathetic, but as always, these events follow a general pattern. Trump does something controversial or ill-advised in concept or in implementation, and then the president's critics overreact to a disproportionate degree, making any of the flaws in the president's idea or his approach seem entirely forgivable by comparison. Chelsea Manning thinks it's weird that the military would prioritize building planes over gender reassignment surgery. Outrageous. George Takai vaguely threatened the president, saying Trump pissed off the wrong community Community and will regret it. Probably regret it like laughing at Trump for losing and saying it's not rigged, unless Trump wins, in which case the Russians did it, and it's totally rigged. And Samantha Bee admitted it takes the combined talent of her entire writing staff to come up with her sharp and witty reaction. Fuck you. It is probably the best material they've ever written but it's still my second favorite overreaction to an article in the Washington Post that claims that even though allowing transgender service in the military is a brand new policy, reversing it is somehow ahistorical. A history lesson for Trump. Transgender soldiers served in the Civil War. Indeed, Lincoln decreed it with the Trannysburg Address. It was lesser known than all that emancipation stuff, but it's in there. Look it up. Anyway, we only get as far as the title before I have to start asking some questions. First, a history lesson for Trump? Let's remember, the military did not allow transgender service members until one year ago. So even if true, this would be a history lesson for Abraham Lincoln and every president in between, including seven-eighths of the Obama term. Plus, even if true, it's not Trump's claim that no transgender people have ever served in the military. It is his claim that that service creates unnecessary difficulties, which very well could have also been the case in the Civil War. Second, it's one thing to post nonsense like this in your opinion section, but that's not where this article resides. It resides in the Washington Post's Retropolis section, which is home to several totally objective history pieces that definitely don't have any modern political agenda whatsoever. And we know this because the Retropolis section is stored categorically under the slash news section of their website, not under slash opinion where you find op-eds stored. The Washington Post is categorizing this as hard objective news for you, not just some ideologue's opinion. Sell us your bullshit if you must, but do us the courtesy of properly labeling your bullshit. Otherwise, you're just bullshitting about your bullshit. So we're not off to a good start. But if you're like me, you're still eager for the history lesson anyway. So let's get into it. Our author gives us brief biographies of three women known to have served in the Union Army during the Civil War. Albert Kasher was born Jenny Hodgers in Ireland, immigrated to the United States as a stowaway, and at 18, enlisted in the Illinois Infantry Regiment as a man. After the war, in which he fought in some 40 actions, Kasher continued to dress in trousers, and in the modern parlance, 
identify as a man. In the modern parlance, how about we understand this person in her contemporary parlance? In a time where there were plenty of incentives for women to pretend to be men. Incentives that don't exist in modern society. But more on that in a minute. Sarah Rosetta Wakeman was driven by poverty to work as a male canal boatman and then sign up with a New York unit to fight for the Union Army. The teenage girl passed as a 21-year-old man named Lion Wakeman and bagged a $154 signing bounty. Recruits were not always closely examined, particularly toward the end of the war when armies on both sides were desperate for men of any kind. Among boys barely past puberty, the smooth face of a female imposter could easily have passed without remark. Mary Edwards Walker was a New York physician who served as the only woman surgeon for the Union Army. Walker never claimed to be a man, but she insisted, against all custom, on dressing as one. She was known as the little lady in pants in her army years, and she adopted more masculine garb as time went on. By the end of her life, she wore a top hat and tails. Okay, so were we just talking about cross-dressers here? Because it really seems like you're just talking about cross-dressers. Cross-dressing has roiled the ranks of armies at least as far back as Joan of Arc, the 15th century military genius who was burned at the stake for heresies that included wearing a man's uniforms. The Civil War was a time when the ranks were filled with hundreds of women who cut their hair, put on pants, and took up arms on both sides of the war between the states. Okay, so this really is just an accidental argument that cross-dressing and transgender Genderism are the same thing. File this one with the other famous accidental arguments, like the Huffington Post inadvertently making a case for gay conversion therapy because racial dating preferences aren't okay, or that time they accidentally debunked the wage gap by joking about cheap women's labor. Why outsource all your production to faraway countries like India, China, and Narnia when we have the cheapest and best workforce right here in the good old US of A? Women. Yeah. Yes, if that option were available to businesses, it would be very attractive, wouldn't it? The problem with this argument that yesterday's cross-dressers are today's transgender people is it's supposedly hateful in any other context. If you argue that yesterday's cross-dressers are today's transgender people, well, that's just the obvious and natural conclusion in the modern parlance. But if you argue that modern transgender people are simply past cross-dressers, you're gonna get a stern fuck you tweet from the entire writing staff at Full Frontal with Samantha B. But look, I'm not gonna say it's impossible that people we would now consider to be transgender served in the Civil War. I just need to see some evidence more convincing than women impersonating men even if that evidence is circumstantial. The problem with this author's argument is the circumstantial evidence that is available suggests these women were simply cross-dressers because there were clear incentives to cross-dress and to impersonate at the time. As the foreword to a compilation of wartime letters from Sarah Rosetta Wakeman, one of the female soldiers our author references reads, an estimated 400 young women disguised themselves as men and easily finessed the superficial physical exams to enlist in Union and Confederate regiments. Their motives ranged from patriotism and love of adventure to a desire to stay with husbands or lovers who enlisted. In a time when military service was not available to women, in a time when women were not legal equals to men, there were several incentives to impersonate men, to obtain things exclusively available to them. Absent evidence otherwise, I'm left to assume that's what these women were after. And perhaps not, but I'd be more sympathetic to this author's argument if he could show some examples of male Civil War soldiers who lived their post-war days as women. In that case, there would likely be little motive outside of sincere desire to be another gender, because there wouldn't be much else to gain. It's curious that we have hundreds of cases of female to male Civil War era transitions, yet virtually none in the other direction. And probably most disappointingly, even if we grant this history lesson as historically accurate, so what? Who cares? It's premised upon reasoning that says, if it was done in the past, then it should continue. But when else are social justice cases built upon such reasoning? They aren't. The past is always framed as something to escape from, not something to return to. Unless, of course, it forms a convenient argument for your social justice cause. In that case, it's perfectly valid. And maybe that's it. 
Maybe convenience is the glue that holds this whole worldview together, the one consistent philosophical basis it has. But if convenience is your game, I have an even more convenient anti-Trump argument for you. Stop tweeting half-baked ideas. And please, treat major policy shifts with the sincerity they deserve. Give that one a try. Believe it or not, it's even more persuasive with the public than your compelling case that Civil War era women sometimes wore pants. Thanks as always for listening and for supporting this channel. Always appreciate that thoughtful discussion down below and especially over on Twitter that is at ML Christensen. You're always welcome to coming out and chat in my live streams. Those are linked down in the description. Looking forward to it. Okay.